could you explain some of those uh, describe some of those chemicals um when what they're in like i know we were talking about um pesticides which obviously are used for agriculture but i mean there's probably chemicals in our household there's probably chemicals that we're exposed to probably fairly frequently depending on maybe our profession or so on but i mean i'm sure there's plenty of these chemicals or these other pollutants that exist in our environment that we're exposed to regularly could you uh detail some of those for for us i think it would be hard to find home <laughs> which does not have many of these chemicals so so and one way to think about it is just you know think about walking around your house so um in the kitchen um i worry a lot about um food containers so anything that is plastic and comes in contact with food is likely to um increase the exposure to class of chemicals called phthalates um, which make plastic soft and flexible. So think about squishy plastics, think about rubber duckies, um, mm -hmm. shower curtains and so on. Um, those phthalates have the ability to lower testosterone. And that's really a bad thing, especially for male reproductive function. It also affects females. Um, then also in our kitchen, um, our, um, we find uh, bisphenol A, which is um, sort of this flip side, it makes plastic hard. And those hard bottles, hard water bottles or baby bottles or you know, hard containers, um, it also lines tin cans. Um, it's also um, in pizza boxes for some reason, mm -hmm. but um, it's, it's all over. And, and, and people say, and I say based on our studies, that the primary source of exposure to these chemicals is through food. Mm. Okay. 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 So um, I think a, a good rule of thumb is try not to put your food in contact with plastic if you can avoid it. So you have alternatives. You can use ceramic, you can use glass, you can use metal. Um, those are all non-toxic um, as long as there are no coatings in them. Mm -hmm. um, Okay. like a tin can that's coated with BPA. Mm -hmm. um, then you can move into other rooms of the house. So if you're gonna move into the living room, um, you could think about your sofa and it has probably flame retardants in it, which are also endocrine disruptors. Um, if you happen to have wall covering or floor covering that's PVC, um, mm -hmm. polyvinyl chloride, that has phthalates in it. Um, and then if you go to the bathroom, um, and you've got just many, many personal care products, um, sunscreen, um, lotions. You know. Phthalates are put into personal care products because they increase the absorption. So as you know, if you put a cream on your arm or your hand, you come back, look at it again, 20 minutes, it's gone, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you want that. Mm -hmm. And what helps that make that happen is phthalates, certain phthalates, diethyl phthalate does that. So um, it's go obviously going into your body, right? Yeah. It's going into your bloodstream. Okay, um, and anything with fragrance, um, anything, you get that because it smells nice, but that smell is really actually a, a sign that you probably shouldn't have that product in your home. And that's particularly true of air fresheners and things that you hang in your car to make it smell better. Um, that is all emitting phthalates. So it's, it's all over. And the, and, and the Centers for Disease Control has measured these in representative samples of U.S. population. It's in everybody. There's like 95% of people have phthalates and bisphenol A and these what we call PFOAs and these flame retardants in their bodies. So it's there, <laughs> whether yeah. we want it or not. Right? Okay. Um, how does this directly impact the reproductive systems of, of uh, males and females and human beings. Uh, you mentioned, you know, it affects sperm count, obviously, but um, I mean, what are some of the impacts that that directly has on our ability right. to right. produce children? I spent, yeah. I spent um, 20 years looking at that question. Mm -hmm. And the way, way I did it was to first recognize that the time in your life that you're most sensitive to chemicals, harmful chemicals, is when your body's undergoing change. And the period of greatest change is in the womb, obviously. Mm -hmm. You're going from a 
few cells to an or organism, right? And um, there are other periods of rapid change. One of them is adolescence, but primarily it's prenatal exposure. That's I'm most worried about and most people are most worried about. So there's two reasons. One is that a little bit goes a long way. A very small dose at that time has a very big effect. Mm. In other words, those cells are extremely, extremely sensitive. The second reason it's so important is because whatever you change in development, and we could talk a little more about that development, that development has been programmed to occur at a certain time under the influence of certain hormones. And if you mess that up, you introduce changes that cannot be fixed. Okay. So they're called organizational changes. You're interfering with the organization of the organism. Mm -hmm. So you want me to tell you specifically what? Yeah, kind of yeah. If you could just ex explain that a little bit, uh, uh, yeah. in as much detail as you'd like, yeah. Okay. All right. So where I, so the reason I started studying phthalates was because in animals, it had been shown that when the mother was exposed to certain phthalates and those that most effectively lower testosterone, basically the most powerful testosterone lowering phthalates, um, when the mother was exposed to those at a certain time in pregnancy, then the male offspring developed something which was so striking that they gave it a name and they called it the phthalate syndrome. Mm -hmm. So that was noticed, that was published in 2005. When I saw that, I thought, well, actually it was talked about before then, but around 2000. And when I saw that and heard that, I thought, wow, I wonder if that's happening in humans. Because I knew that humans were exposed to phthalates, everybody in the United States was. And so it was possible that human male infants also would have something like this syndrome. So what is this syndrome? Okay, I have to now get sort of down in there and really look at the developing fetus in the, you know, very early first trimester. Okay, so it's very, very small. It's rapidly dividing, rapidly developing. One of the things that develops, and which is, of course, important for reproduction, is the genitals. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, so the genital tract starts out neutral. That is, it's the same in males and females, genetic males, genetic females. Okay, and then when the fetal testes kicks into gear and starts making testosterone, that testosterone produces changes in the genetic male. You with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when testosterone is introduced, then that genetic male starts differentiating, becoming different from the female. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the penis starts developing, the testicles start developing, and so on. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't happen, then what is left, what <laughs> it, it remains female, basically. So the default mm -hmm. is female. Okay. okay. So the male is developed under the influence of testosterone. Okay. Now think about what if there wasn't enough testosterone to do the job? Mm -hmm. And that's what happens when phthalates are introduced because phthalates, I told you, lower testosterone. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so when the th mother is exposed to these testosterone lowering phthalates, that gets into her bloodstream, goes into the fetus, crosses the placental barrier, goes into the fetal testes. The fetal testes does not produce the right amount of testosterone, and the male is not completely masculinized. Mm. Okay, now I'm going to dive in a little deeper and tell you what that means. Yeah, please. Okay. Okay, for so one thing, and this has made headlines all, all over, the, the penis is somewhat smaller. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's Fair. one thing that happens. The scrotum is somewhat smaller. The scrotum is less likely to be completely descended into, uh, I'm sorry, the testicles are smaller and less likely to be descended into the scrotum. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the most important thing is a measure which most people have never heard of unless they're teenagers and know about the taint you know about the taint? I know what it is, yes. Okay, yeah. that's what we're talking about here, okay? okay? Yeah. Okay, but its technical name is anogenital distance. It's the distance from the anus to the genitals, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so in a typical male, mammal, human and otherwise, that distance is a, 
50 to 100% that is double in the male compared to the female. Okay. Much longer. Right. Okay? But if testosterone is not as high as it should be because of phthalates or other reasons, then that distance, that taint length, if you will, is shorter than it would be. Mm. And that turns out to be the key to the story. Mm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because that distance tells you a lot of things. One of the things it tells you is how much testosterone was there. It's a, like a measure of how much testosterone there was there. By the way, this works for females too. If you want to know, I can tell you about that too. But, and then it also predicts how good the man's sperm function is going to be when he grows up. It's mm. kind of amazing. But you see, it, it gets, to, if you will, impaired. The whole reproductive system gets impaired. And the signal for that is the shorter anal genital distance. So we, we, I'll tell you what we actually did. We had pregnant women, we got their urine, we measured phthalates in their urine. Then we got the babies, we brought them in and we measured them to see what this taint length was, what the penal size was, how descended were the testicles. And we showed that the phthalate syndrome existed in humans. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I did it all again in a second study. So I replicated that. And then we said, okay, we can't wait for them to grow up and have sperm, but let's look in another group of men, men that already have sperm and look and see whether this length is related to sperm count. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we brought in uh, several hundred undergraduates at University of Rochester and we, you know, they signed up for the study, they got $75, and then they gave us a semen sample and they allowed us to measure this distance. And then we saw that the shorter the distance, the lower the sperm count. Wow. Pretty amazing, huh? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is not a fairy tale. This is no. really true. It's no, been I've, replicated, I've... published, you know, confirmed. Sure. Um, and and um, by the way, men who are at an infertility clinic also have a shorter antigenal distance. So it's linked to infertility, it's linked to sperm count, and it's also linked to, by the way, um, genital birth defects in males. So if, if that sh is short, the boy is more likely to have various birth defects of his genitals. Okay. Um, the bottom line is phthalates cause abnormalities of the genital tract, which play out, because our big story is sperm count, right? play out into lower sperm count and lower fertility. Right. So that's, that's science in extreme detail, probably more than you want to hear, but oh, um, it that's... took 20 years to show this. Yeah. And by the way, um, between 15 and $20 million. Hmm. Those studies are extremely expensive. Yeah. And, and so this is a hard thing to dig out, right? But I wanted to get an accurate, complete picture for at least one set of chemicals. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's that story. And hopefully, hopefully you're convinced. <laughs>